best 43 seconds they were <laughs> ever in football. Well, the game started. Well, they, um, they took kick. And then it went back to middles for a half. Chelsea's second touch of the ball. And then Dennis Wise got the ball. Dink from Wise, and that was it. He passed it to Dimitrio and making a cup of tea. As Dimitrio started to run with the ball, everything appeared to be slow motion. We're still celebrating the kickoff, really. Suddenly there was a telephone call, and I thought, shall I go and answer it? It's just, just, just the space they give him. Roberto kept running and running, then pow. Dimitrio shoots! Blink and you miss it. Game set and match. What about this? Just getting comfortable and back up again. I think you must respond to the scene that someone sets up in front of us. Possibly the quickest ever goal in a Wembley Cup final. I just couldn't believe it. I was just amazed. God's about more than anything else. Just jumping around, yeah. cuddling my granddad. I was so shocked. Brilliant. I was shocked as well. I've never celebrated like uh, like that ever before after 43 seconds. <laughs> Having an orgasm, to be <laughs> honest. <laughs> I think Chelsea always lived on the memories of the past, didn't they? And that's like now, obviously, ghosts have been light. Robbie Musto battling with Dennis Wise. It's difficult to imagine that there's ever been a better 43 seconds in Chelsea's 92-year history. And Di Matteo shoots! Oh, what about this? What about this? Together with Eddie Newton's nerve settler 83 minutes later, it meant an awful lot of this. And at long last, no more of this. Blue is the colour, football is the game, we're all together. I'm pleased for the Chelsea people that are, are there now and the supporters that uh, they've emulated us because they keep talking about us and now we've gone. We're history. I get a buzz every time I'm there. It's, it's exciting, it really is exciting now. In five years, I've never seen a club transform so much. A club which had worshipped the names of Osgood and Bonetti, Hutchinson and Webb, finally had a new team of heroes. Some were Stamford Bridge born and raised, others were definitely not. After almost three decades of knocking, nobody could deny the quality of the football once again being played on the Fulham Road. I mean, my favourite is Zola. You've got Viale, you've got Leboeuf. You've now got uh, even a host of new new players now. The foreigners that come in there, they don't look like foreigners. They do when you see them technically, but they don't look like they're apart from the rest. They look like Chelsea boys. They've mixed in. You know, you look at Matteo and you look De Matteo and you look at Dennis Wise. They look like two cheeky lads that are from Chelsea. You know, and they and they and Zola, and they all look part of it. Blues fans love them, and they were quickly learning the English. For the feeling is mutual. It's been very nice for me to find that the supporters were very, very close to me. They, 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 they supported me very well and this is why I gave performance. Without their help, I couldn't do what I did. It was the bird who got him through and Schmeichel has stayed back and Viali has scored! I to say thank you to the supporters because they've always been so kind with me, so, so close with me shouting, screaming, viali, viali all the time, even if I was doing just a, a, a little warm-up. Yeah, yeah, he's here, he's here, he's here, every, everywhere. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, I like it in England in particular, in, uh, in Chelsea. It's, it's perfect atmosphere. That FA Cup victory marked a new chapter in Chelsea's long but only sporadically glorious history. Chelsea are back, sang the fans, as they had so many times in the 27 years since Ron Harris brought the FA Cup back from Manchester. This time, though, they were right. The new chapter began four years ago when the Chelsea chairman decided that it was about time his sleeping giant finally woke up. Step one was the appointment of Glenn Hoddle as player coach. Hoddle may not have had much impact on the club's league position, but his sheer presence brought glamour and self-belief back to the club, added 10,000 to the weekly gate, and finally saw Chelsea regain its long-cherished reputation as a good cup side. Oh yes, and he also signed Mark Hughes and Rude Hullett. Everybody kept saying it was a sleeping giant and never really achieved what they could have achieved. And I think Glenn, to be fair, went a long way to putting a stop to that and made everybody more professional, the players, the staff. I mean, you look around the training ground these days and the stadium's taking shape and it's a, how a, a top club should be now. I think when you look back on Glenn's period of, uh, 
of the leadership of Chelsea. He's a bit like John the Baptist. I mean, he arrives and doesn't do the job. He's preparing the way for somebody else. But the fact that Glenn arrived suddenly gave Chelsea a buzz again. It suddenly meant that people wanted to come to the club, whereas, you know, there were some very nice, decent guys, Ian Porterfield, Bobby Campbell, people I liked as managers. With the best one in the world, they didn't have that glamour that Glenn had. And although, you know, we were 11th when Glenn arrived and 11th when he left, Hullet and Mark Hughes and people like that were willing to contemplate uh, uh, coming to the club. Glenn was a, a good manager. He, uh, he had his ways of doing things. He wanted to play certain ways and uh, it, was, it was nice, attractive football. I enjoyed it under Glenn Oddle. He, he taught me a few things, you know, and uh, about, about not football, but life as well, I think, uh, which is good. Here he is again, another telling cross. What a goal! The ball from Hoddle was superb. Success in the pre-season Makita tournament raised expectations, as they have been so often raised at Stamford Bridge, but the introduction of Glenn's beautiful game to all levels of the club was clearly going to take time. In the league, the club was destined for mid-table, despite typical Chelsea victories against Manchester United and Liverpool. As for the FA Cup, a team that took two games to dispose of a Barnet side that included Glenn's younger brother, Carl, could hardly claim to have its name on it, could it? Early ahead of him. And Clark really committing the defenders. It's a 1-1 a one -one draw with Sheffield Wednesday in the fourth round suggested not. Only those with fond memories of that epic Milk Cup encounter ten years earlier travelled to Hillsborough with much hope. Everyone didn't give us a chance, and everyone said that we'll go back to Hillsborough and we'll get beat. Uh, everyone in the country most probably thought the same thing except for the 11 players that went out on the pitch. For me, that was the most satisfactory uh, performance of the season. It was a great result and that's what really made us think, oh, I'll tell you what, this could be our year, you know, going all the way. Gavin Peacock, who gets it into the middle to Burley. Chelsea have done it. There was a little bit of belief, more belief about the place and we went to Oxford, we went a goal down. The captain, Chris Allen, and Beecham is in here, it's a great chance, it's a goal for Whereas in the past, I think we'd have panicked. We just kept playing away in, playing away in. Eventually, we got back in the game and we managed to win the game 2 1. Victories at Oxford and against Wolves finally convinced doubters that this time Chelsea were on their way. A semi final against Luton Town was hardly the glamour tie that fans had hoped for, except for the fact that it was played at Wembley and the Luton centre forward was Kerry Dixon. It was just something else. The reception was was phenomenal, and uh, I'm very grateful for that. It was basically the most emotional day of uh, my football in life, and it probably eclipsed uh, me playing for England um, in the Aztec Stadium. The sun shone, and Dixon was too much the gentleman to continue the long and painful tradition of former players scoring crucial goals against their old club. Peacock did well. Spencer, Peacock, number two. And the gap now. The return to Wembley a month later for Chelsea's first FA Cup final for 24 years was to prove a distinctly less enjoyable experience. Still, having beaten Manchester United twice in the league, hopes were perennially high, as a future Chelsea star recalls. In the league games, Chelsea scored a goal and then defended very well and United weren't able to get back into the game. If Chelsea had scored, uh, I think with Gavin Peacock hit the bar, uh, which was a great chance would have been very difficult for United. Peacock! Peacock! Oh, he's hit the bar! We went into the game really confident, started off really well. We was playing so well that, you know, we, had, we should have scored in the time that we was in the first half and it didn't really work for us. They was always going to come out, be improved for the second half and in the end they were too much for us. I gave the first penalty away, Frank gave the second penalty away and that was the end of the game really. Really, they just had a bundle of confidence and they were just they could do what they want. Our heads dropped and the story of the game was over, really. It was a wretched afternoon and a wretched evening for anyone in blue and white. But with Manchester United landing the double, Chelsea were through to the Cup Winners' Cup. In a season again destined to end in mid-table anonymity, at least it gave us something to look forward to, provided Glenn could find enough players to meet strict rules that classed even Steve Clark as a foreigner. It was disappointing for me because I'd been at the club a long time and actually ended up missing out in the first European game at Stamford Bridge because I was a foreigner. 
even though I'd been, I mean, I'd been playing in the English league for like eight years. Uh, and I think it affected us all the way through. We had to keep shuffling the, the pack a little bit and bringing players in that, that hadn't been playing regularly. And obviously that upsets your, your rhythm and your, the balance of the team. A potentially tricky tie against FK Austria Vienna was clinched by a vital John Spencer goal. The best night of that particular cup run was the, the night we played Bruges. Uh, we lost 1-0 in the, the away leg and we, we felt really confident we could turn it over. And as soon as the game started and the crowd got right behind us, I think we just we knew we were going to win it. And I've got a feeling the crowd knew they were going to win it as well and it was a really good night. Coming back from 1-0 was one thing, but from 3-0 in a European semi-final, that was definitely quite another. I think it was a bit naive going to Zaragoza. Gave them a bit too much space and time and basically we lost it in the first leg when we was 3-0 down, which was a shame because we done we, we proved that we could beat them well in the second leg. All charged out by Kurt Robinson. Now is that the moment that the tide turns Chelsea's way? The crowd got right behind us and we very nearly pulled off what would have been a miracle. Roared on by the most passionate crowd Stamford Bridge had seen in years, Chelsea very nearly pulled off the impossible, with goals from Sinclair, Steen and Furlong raising the sort of hopes that only a vital away goal scored by Santiago Aragon could dash. Once again, the highlight of a huddle season had been a glorious and memorable semi-final. But at least cup runs were beginning to be a bit of a habit. The following season was simply extraordinary. It began with the shock arrival of Rude Hullett. Rude Hullett at Stamford Bridge? Surely some mistake. And in May... 1995, uh, Glenn and I sat down and we worked on a, a strategy of uh, raising the, uh, the profile of the club and realising that uh, with football, uh, particularly in Europe, changing uh, dramatically and the European uh, league probably no further than the end of the century away, there would never be a greater opportunity for Chelsea to try and get into the big time and drag itself uh, to the level to fulfil the potential that um, has so often been uh, talked about. And so Glenn and I identified uh, two players that we would like uh, to bring in. Those two players were Ruud Hullett and uh, Paul Gascoigne. Well, history, of course, has recorded that uh, we pulled off the coup of uh, Ruud Hullett. We weren't uh, successful with Gascoigne, and he decided to, uh, to go to uh, Glasgow Rangers. I think it was um, a club that wanted uh, more than that what, what they were doing for the last couple of years. And of course, because Glenn was there and I knew Glenn uh, and I played against him and then uh, I knew also the way he wanted to play, I, uh, yeah, I decided to come to Chelsea. Now, in the beginning, you know, it was of course uh, like a culture shock for me because uh, you know, I lived uh, for eight years on the highest level. It was also something that I needed because I think uh, I lived for eight years on a straight regime and uh, I, needed, uh, I needed also some space uh, privately and, uh, and also on the pitch and uh, I, that's why I think it was the best decision what I, what I made. Then came another present from Manchester United. Ever since I've come here, the Chelsea fans have been marvellous to me. Um, it could have been very easy for them to turn against me because of the United connection, but uh, sometimes I was guilty of taking the game home with me. But since I've come here, I feel more relaxed in my football, the attitude to the club is a lot more relaxed, but certainly just as professional, that relaxed atmosphere has helped me and I think it's helped my football as well. It was a season that would end with Hoddle's appointment as England coach, probably the best reason that any of Chelsea's 19 managers to date has ever had for leaving. But before all that came the league. Well, by now, 11th had a comforting feel about it and yet another cup run. A third round draw against Newcastle United was not a promising start and a disastrous last-minute equaliser, a far from perfect end. The boys were gutted the, the result was Stamford Bridge, but uh, we still went up there believing we could win. And then uh, we played well and was unlucky to get go down. The game up there was a marvellous performance, uh, probably our best of that year, uh, and we were good value. Yes. OK, it went to the penalties, but uh, uh, we felt we could have won it before then. You're confident when you're going out to face penalties, and... Uh... It puts pressure on the uh, opposition. You just 
do your best. I think in that game we showed that we could do better than we thought we could do, and uh, that gave, I think, the, the group a lift. Having seen off one of the best teams in the land, Chelsea progressed to the quarter-finals in typical style, beating another Premiership side, QPR, 2-1, before taking two goes to get past Grimsby. A quarter-final against Wimbledon was never one for the faint-hearted, but eventually Chelsea won through. The game was a bit of a stalemate, it was one all. I think there was a corner and in it, it got broken down and I was still up there and then uh, Spenny and Wisey combined and it come over. Dubry, it's there. And all I can remember, I was just going mad, I was thinking, yes, and I was just running, I don't know, I was just thinking, just stay that way, just stay that way, and I was like, glory boy, you know, I just want to hug the glory, but Sparky scored and spoiled it, but uh, we still got through anyway. And the prize was a semi-final draw against Manchester United on a cabbage patch of a pitch that had once been Villa Park. Those whose memories stretch back to the 1960s when Chelsea contested three FA Cup semi-finals in a row at the Aston Villa ground travelled with expectations a little on the low side. The one bit of good news was that this time Mark Hughes was playing for us. I was doing my jinking left winger yeah, uh, impression and uh, I was able just to swing it over and uh, Rudy was able to nod it in through through the dreadlocks. So. We survived the half-time and we'd got it reorganised and then to start off the second half the way we did, losing Terry, feeling straight away. Uh, I think you can carry one injury in a, a game like that, but to get another one so soon afterwards and then have to re reshape the team again, I think we lost our way a little bit. The injuries and a back pass that brought tears to the eyes meant that for the second time in three years, United had thwarted the club's bid for cup glory. As the crowd made its way quietly home, reflecting on an afternoon when Michael Dubry ran his studs off on the right wing, one man had already worked out what was needed if Chelsea were ever to go that extra mile. We just missed the quality, you know, that they had more than, than we had. We could cope with them one, one half, but uh, then later on, you know, uh, it was just difference in class that they had. Hullet would get the chance to do something about it sooner than he could possibly have imagined. A uh, warm welcome to Glenn and congratulations on the appointment uh, from everybody at the Football Association, including Terry, of course. I think it's the you know most rewarding job I've done in, in football. And, you know, I'm very proud the fact that you know I can leave uh, with a foundation that, I, that I've built. Not just myself. I think that's very unfair. I should be saying there's a lot of people, a lot of backroom staff, all the staff, Peter, Eddie, Graham. Queen Williams, you know, the whole lot, the medical stuff, uh, and plus the players. So there's a lot of people, but it was a very sad occasion for me. It's a very sad, it was done with a heavy heart. And as I've said, there is no way that I would have left Chelsea Football Club for any other club in Europe. Um, this is the only job, really, that I would have left a club for. Huddle's three-year experiment was over. Chelsea's league form remained gloriously inconsistent, and despite three thrilling cup runs, silverware was still conspicuous by its absence. But the fans knew a revolution had taken place, that at last something special was happening at Stamford Bridge. They also knew exactly who they wanted to continue Hoddle's work, as they made abundantly clear at the last game of the season. More and more, the success that Hoddle and Hullet have brought to the club was reminding season supporters of another great run of results. Not just the triumph of the famous 1970s team, but a 10-year period which, without a doubt, was the most successful in the club's history. So far, anyway. It ended with Chelsea's surprise defeat against Stoke City in the League Cup in 1972. But it began with the newly promoted side of 1963, led by a young and enthusiastic Scottish manager. Doherty's diamonds were about to sparkle. But it wasn't polish the team needed when Tommy Doherty took over in the autumn of 1961. It was knocking into shape. Ted Drake, Doherty's predecessor, left behind a side in transition. Jimmy Greaves, the most exciting youth prospect the club had ever produced, had been sold the season before. Goal scoring to him was a piece of cake. He's the best, he's the best goal scorer I've ever seen, Greaves. Uh. Jimmy, that... Uh, Quickness in the box. Jimmy won't quick over 50 yards. Didn't have to be. He never run 50 yards in a game. Off the mark, quickness and control. And he's a lead people standing. We'd have won the championship four or five. I'm sure we'd have won it certainly two or three times anyway. If we could have kept Jimmy. With Greaves seemed to go Chelsea's hopes for the future, despite a first team that already included Peter Bonetti, Barry Bridges, Terry Venables and Chelsea's eventual record goalscorer Bobby Tambling. Perhaps the side were too young to avoid relegation. The old stages, uh, they were going through the motions. 
the, the, and when I f one, took my first one or two training sessions with them and coaching sessions, they didn't want to know. The next year, it was the change round. It was all the, our younger boys coming in, and it was a very young side that moulded together and got on particularly well together. Chelsea were back at the first attempt, and the most successful decade in the club's history was about to begin, with Doherty fielding a team packed with names destined to become legends. Well, with uh, Peter Van Ettingo, brilliant, world class. For my money, he was world class. Great in the air. It was a waste of time crossing the ball. Anyone that crossed the ball, I just used to start laughing. I mean, it was like just taking grapes out of a tree. The cat, they called him the cat. Full back, a fellow called Ken Cholito. Arguably the best right full back I've ever seen in my life. George Cohn would never get a World Cup medal in a million years if, if he hadn't got injured, because he was the best right full back I've ever seen. We bought a left full back from Scotland for 5,000 quid, Eddie McCready. Great player, great tackler, great distributor of the ball. Lovely crack pot he was, you know. Tim loved Chelsea and they loved him. Then with a young kid come in at the side, John Hollands. Little cherub of a boy, actually. Quick, great tackle, good distributor of the ball. So fit and so enthusiastic, it wasn't true. And all I call Marvin Hinton, we got from Charlton for 23,000 quid. Next to Bobby Moore, the best sweeper I've ever seen. He was a fantastic player. Ronnie Harris, outstanding. We call him the late Chopper Harris, like, he's not dead, he's just late all the time, like, you know. Great man marker. Greaves and all the great players hate it playing again. You know? Okay, I'm not a, a, a big, big lad on what money five foot eight, but you know, I think I might have frightened one or two fellas that looked in the programme before and said, "Oh, Chop Harris is playing today." You know, especially some of the forwards that were a little bit uh, not not that brave. Venables was a great player, captain. He was a regular captain before Chopper took over. Ronnie took over. Good player. Uh, Great vision, General Rommel, I call him, he was a fox, crafty. I, mean, yeah, I was always a bit wary of Terry, actually. Good fun, great company, super lad. But he, he overstepped his authority at, at times. But whatever Doherty's admiration of Venable's skills as a footballer, the two were destined not to get on. It was a personality clash that would eventually lead to the breakup of a brilliant side. Barry Bridges we had, centre forward, first touch, not very good, uh, very quick, uh, strong, Bridges. like Bobby Tamlin, that one side forward, strong as an ox, great goal scorer, good pro, lovely lad. That was, that was really a fun team on the pitch and off it, I mean, can you imagine people like Eddie McCready, Terry Venables, the Harris, the Harris brothers. For the moment, however, Stamford Bridge was swinging, and so was the King's Road. It was a coincidence that would seal Chelsea's reputation as a fashionable club forever. I mean, with George Graham, who I bought for 5,000 quid from the Villa, magnificent player, very elegant player. George liked the bright lights, and, and so did Terry. It was just opened my eyes up, you know, to how big London is, and, you know, what goes on in London, and how difficult, and there's unique problems in managing or playing in London. The rest of the country don't seem to have. But it was Chelsea's achievements on the pitch that would cement the club's reputation as a cup side. With so much attention understandably focused on the 1970 cup side, Doherty's achievements in the mid-1960s have sometimes unfairly been overlooked. And we got the three semi-finals in the final in, in, in three years in succession, which a lot of people forget. 64, 65, 65, 66, 66, 67. So we could have been in three finals with a little bit of luck. A game, minutes away from three finals. We were an, a, a very, very good cup side. We were good every four weeks. In 1965, Chelsea's second season back in the first division and Peter Osgood's first at the club, Doherty was not that far off a treble. Third place in the league for only the second time in the club's history, winning the League Cup by beating Leicester and securing a place in the Fairs Cup the next season. Only the FA Cup semi-final would go down as a disappointment, with Chelsea travelling to Villa Park but losing 2-0 to Liverpool. Another semi-final the following year would end exactly the same way. But it was European football that really fired the imagination, both of the fans and Doherty's fast-maturing side. Already keen on the limelight, Europe offered them an even bigger stage on which to strut their stuff. It began with AS Roma at Stamford Bridge, a night which saw Venables score a remarkable hat-trick. He was so inventive in the game. His, his mind was always thinking about different things, Terry. And I always remember the, the wall against Roma, and he walked up to the wall, 
and he, he, he paced it out. And he went to the referee and turned like that to say, referee, they're not 10 yards. And then somebody slid it down the side of the wall and he went and knocked the roll in. Of course, everybody stood still, the, the, the Italians. They couldn't believe it. A 2-1 win on aggregate over Venus Sport Club saw Chelsea progress to football's Holy of Holies, the San Siro, and a third-round draw against AC Milan. In Italy, a vital away goal kept Chelsea in the hunt, despite Milan scoring twice. Back at Stamford Bridge, the scores were reversed, leaving the scores level after two legs. A third game at the San Siro ended 1-1 after extra time. Chelsea went through on the toss of a coin. With an Osgood goal eventually getting the better of TSV München, it was Chelsea that progressed to a dream semi-final against Barcelona. Chelsea were playing Playing with the big boys, but already one future Barcelona coach had realised that his time at Stamford Bridge was about to come to a premature end. The team was developing and getting a lot better, but Tom, I think, had made his mind up that he was going to replace me. And I can remember we played at Barcelona, and um, Charlie Cook, who came to replace me, came in um, the dressing room before the game. I mean, it was a little bit off-putting. <laughs> and uh, to be fair, Charlie went on and and done exceptionally well for Chelsea. And we played them over in Barcelona, and it was 2-0, I think it was. And we come to Stamford Bridge, and we, sh and we had a few injuries. And we should have played them, I think, on a Tuesday night. And uh, with these injuries, we couldn't, we didn't, we had no chance. So I got the fire brigade in the night, at night, that night, and flooded the whole pitch. It was a quagmire, it was a beautiful pitch. It was a quagmire, actually. The referee come the next day and examined the pitch, and of course it's just sunk into the ground like the game was put off, wasn't it? Uh, we played it uh, the next night, and we drew up. We beat them two 0 so that was a draw. So we tossed for ends, and we lost the toss. We go to Barcelona, where we eventually lost five nothing over there. So we got our comeuppance for my shady tactics with the, the fire engines. By now, Venables and Bridges have both played their final game for Chelsea, thanks to an extraordinary incident that had taken place the season before. One or two of them started being a bit naughty, you know. But in those days, I was too much of a sergeant major. I mean, I was a disciplinarian, but I was uh, ridiculous. I think when I look back on it now, I was too, too much of a sergeant major. And I think we were having quite a lot of arguments leading up to that. The, the, it was a them and us situation. And really, and then on the way back, he said, that's it, you don't go out. and. Uh, it was the final straw for some of us because he'd been doing this inconsistent attitude for a while. It was a move out of Blackpool for I think it was almost a week and we went out one night and we took a bit back. There was a curfew but uh, we thought on a Wednesday night it, was, it wasn't too near a Saturday and we went back out again and uh, we upset Tommy and Tommy just sent us all home. A lot of people thought quite right and a lot of people thought ridiculous, too strict, which fair enough is their own opinion. And some of the players uh, were very friendly with Terry Venables and George Graham who, who were quite friendly with one or two of the media men and of course the media men came out on their side saying that I was too strong in doing this. It was headlines, we just didn't realise how huge it was and it, was, it, it did turn out a real nightmare and that was I think the, the beginning of the end. And it became a stage really, a situation where it was them and me, whether they were going to pay attention to me or they weren't. I gave them a little bit of a leeway regularly and they abused it. That was it in a nutshell. He just saw things, he said, no, he said, I can't have it. And I can't have them sort of people playing for me, and that was it. He broke it up. And I think it was a shame, in all fairness. It was one of his few mistakes he made, because, uh, you know, it, it was a good sign, and uh, it could have only got better. It culminated in, eventually, the other players moving on, uh, and the younger element of the side staying with it. I, I knew it was coming, and I think that was plain to see. But, you know, you look back and you know, I, I, I broke my heart over it. Um, uh, I was choked to leave because it was such great times. It was, you know, like losing your family. Like I honestly believe that side would probably have been better than the 70 side if it stuck together. But he had this conflict with uh, Terry and uh, he got rid of Terry, got rid of Barry Bridges and Burt Murray and these sort of people who were all friends in them days. And, uh, you know, that's when the, the side split up. Blackpool may have been the beginning of the end, but Doherty still had two more cracking seasons at Stamford Bridge, culminating in his third successive FA Cup run. Venables may have gone to Spurs, Graham to Arsenal, and Bridges and Murray to Birmingham, but Doherty's remaining diamonds, now including Charlie Cook, Tommy Baldwin, and Tony Hately, made it to Wembley without them. The club's first appearance there in a peacetime cup final. And if Osgood hadn't still been recovering from a broken leg, who knows what might have happened. But first it was semi-final time, which by now meant only one thing. It was back to 
Villa Park again, this time to take on Leeds. Surely it would be different this time. It was, but only just. A perfect centre pass from Eddie McCready to Tony Haitley. A free kick for Leeds, a tremendous shot from 25 yards, but it's disallowed as the referee wasn't ready for it. As Erland Johnson learned 30 years later, you need a bit of luck to win the FA Cup. More luck, in fact, than Doherty's team enjoyed at Wembley as they took on a Tottenham team that included two of Chelsea's best ever players, Venables and Greaves. Ron Harris has a shrewd idea about what went wrong, despite a consolation goal from Tambling, the only player ever to score 200 goals for Chelsea. We got beat 2-1 and, you know, they never played particularly well. Uh, the Spurs, but we was absolutely diabolical. We were disastrous. A dramatic score by Bobby Tambling, which gave Chelsea Despite a track record that perhaps only now is being appreciated for its quality, it was time for Doherty to go. I would say overall that was the best, the best side I had, the best side I developed was at Stamford Bridge. And to this day, I've got great affection for the club. They're a marvellous club. And to me, Chelsea will always be very close to my heart like Manchester United is. When Dave Sexton arrived in the autumn of 1967, there's no doubt he took over a cracking side despite discontent in both dressing room and boardroom. We had a great, a great balance. We had a great goalkeeper, a superb goalkeeper. Only second to Banks in the world at that time, I don't care what anybody says. Uh, we had four assassins, we call them. Webb, Dempsey, McCready, Harris. I mean, they could tackle for fun, they loved it. Then you had the great midfield, you had Hudson, Cook and Hollins. I mean, I'm not being funny today. Uh, as I said to people, you know, if they had that midfield at Chelsea today, they, they would still get in the side, that, 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 them three especially. Cook, Hollins, Hudson. Had so much flair, uh, Huddy could rule the game, slow it down, not great pills, and Charlie was the, was the dribbler, and Ollie was the grafter and the worker, and could score great goals from, from any angle and in, from any distance. Good work by Hollins! Oh, against the post! Can he do it? He can! And then we had a, 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 a bunch of, of four lads up front, like Tommy Baldwin, Hutch, myself and Peter Houseman. And it was superb again. It was just a everybody knew what job that to do and you know and, and everybody did it. And, and we were it was just a great balance, it really was, and that was down to Dave, to be honest. It was a side that in five seasons never finished lower than seventh in the league and in 1970 matched the achievements of Tommy Doherty in 1965 and David Calderhead in 1920 by coming third in the first division, helped by a rare double over Manchester United. And Hollins. And into the net by Hutchinson. Having made it to the sixth round of the FA Cup in 68 and 69, Chelsea were determined to do better as the 1970 campaign got underway. Things started well enough with a 3 0 win over Birmingham, but then came a familiar Chelsea stumble. That hiccup with Burnley, because we were 2 0 up at home, Ralph Coates and I think, I can't remember who else scored one. And to go up to Burnley, you think, oh my God, to go up to Burnley and, and try and come away with something, I think we beat them 3-1. We, we, we were very lucky to go through on that, but then it, it, you always need a bit of luck in, in winning the FA Cup. With Crystal Palace dismissed 4-1, the sixth round took Chelsea to QPR and two very familiar faces. Venables and Bridges may have got themselves on the score sheet, but Chelsea ran out winners by four goals to two, helped by an Osgood hat-trick. At a semi-final against Watford at White Hart Lane, the goals were distributed more widely. David Webb, Oscar in the middle. And Oscar! Still he goes on, and a goal by Houseman! Hutchinson, oh a nice little one through there for Houseman. There it is, number five. But to win any FA Cup, you have to beat a top side at some point. The only problem was, Chelsea had saved theirs for the final. And it was Leeds, who earlier in the season had beaten Chelsea 5-2 at Stamford Bridge. Well, I think we were nervous on the day because Leeds were a top side. We'd always had massive battles against them in very early days. In our sort of 64s, 65s, we had some big battles with them. And we were going into this game, I think, second favourite, shall we say. Ron Harris was rather more confident than John Hollins, although he knew the injured Alan Hudson would be much missed. Huddy was a, an exceptional player at... You know, I felt that uh, <clears throat> another one, that the bigger the game, the better he played. Tommy Baldwin coming, no disrespects to Tommy, you know, you would miss anyway. And, and Huddy was one of the three exceptional players in our side then. Peter Osgood, Charlie Cook and Alan Hudson. And they pulled the strings for us. 
As for Peter Osgood, he was on the verge of creating a new record by scoring in every round of the FA Cup, providing he didn't trip over a Wembley hoof print. And we just heard about this beautiful pitch at Wembley, the billiard table, and the first time I played there, and it was absolutely disgrace. It really was. It's terrible. I mean, they'd had the horse show, hadn't they, uh, two weeks before. But uh, I think it was, a, it was a credit to both sides. There was four goals scored, and it was such a good game. Houseman, a beautiful score! One of the reasons that we've done reasonably well over the years against Leeds was had some good players and had some people that could put some stick about. And I think they frightened a lot of the sides. But uh, we had fellas that would stand up for themselves, like you know Ozzy and Hutch and John Dempsey and Webby, that you know could look after themselves. And I think that if you asked anybody at Leeds who that they respected most, I'm sure they would have turned around and said Chelsea. I'm sure David Webb would tell you he got the biggest chasing I've ever ever seen a professional footballer get in any type of football. Dark and Jones are pulled to clear the gap in the middle. A wonderful save by Benetti. We always had that upper hand in that if ever we went a goal down, they knew we'd come back. And that was always in the back of their minds that you've got to get one, two, three up before they'll die, and we weren't going to die easily. I always remember, Hutch had just come through and uh, he crossed the ball, and Norman Hunt had come across, and, and he came across on his left peg and done Hutch right down the shins. And I cut, went across and he just went down on his knees. Now the big fella doesn't go down for nothing. And I went across and said, you right, mate? He said, he said, he hurt me. He said, but he said, I'm not going to let him know. And just after that, I heard Hunter say to him, Hutchinson, if you didn't have a long throw, he said, you wouldn't be in this side. And of course, we got the equaliser with a big Hutch diving in the near post. Hutchinson, a goal! Four minutes to go, what a sensational final. We should have lost that game at Wembley. We could have lost it in the first 90 minutes, perhaps 5-1. But in the extra time, the last half an hour, we could have won it 3-1. A great save by Sprague from Hutch. Battle resumed at Old Trafford over a fortnight later. With Webb and Harris swapping positions, Eddie Gray was about to discover why. The replay was about three weeks after. And from then onwards, we swapped over positions and maybe like the tackle I'd done them in the first few minutes. Nowadays, you'd have got banned for six months. But when you think how uh, he tantalised Webby, you know, he never done that well against me because I think the tackle I'd done him, maybe I should have got sent off. But years ago, the referees was a little bit lenient. But it was an injury to the great Peter Bonetti that was causing Chelsea fans concern. He was thin. If anybody wanted to knock him about, they could easily him because he was like a bag of feathers. But I think he'd done exceptionally well to, to even carry on. For the third time in the final, Chelsea went a goal behind, and for the third time, Chelsea equalised. And the ball win now. Collins again. Osgood. Now Hutchinson. Cook. And Charlie floated this lovely ball there. It was like slow motion, you know, it was like I was floating through the air and I had so much time to pick my spot. I mean, Harvey, who took over from Sprague from Wembley, he didn't come. If he had come, it would have been a different ball game. I think Sprague would have come, but he didn't come. It was such a lovely weighted ball that gave me the time. And as I went to glance, he went one way, I just flicked it in the other. And when I got up, I looked across because I thought it was offside. Because there was nobody near me. There was nobody within 10 yards of me. And you never get that with a Leeds defence. Brilliantly made, brilliantly taken, and Harvey had no chance at all. You could see them there then, again, visually, their shoulders round and their shoulders drop. And we were just needing that goal. We got it. We were three, four, five yards sharper than them. And uh, it was only a matter of time before we got the, the second one. Near to the penalty box, and up goes Dempsey and Webb as Hutchinson prepares to take the throw. Hutch took the long throw. I got a little touch to it, and he flicked off Jackie Charlton's head and went right over the far post. I mean, if I hadn't got a touch, I think Big Jack would have knocked it and it had gone. But it went right through the far post. And then, throw is a goal! Yes, a goal! And Big Dave is, as usual, you know, at Webby, 150 per centre. You know, I mean, got more cuts than Henry Cooper. This guy, he was so brave, it's unreal. He's gone in and Cooper's headed the ball out. And it's hit Davy on the face and gone back in. And once he went in, three of them sat down on their backsides, the Leeds players. We knew them with him. Chelsea have won it. And there's Webb getting mobbed. The scorer at the winning goal. It was a wonderful moment that any Chelsea fan over 35 can remember to this day. For the first time in its then 65-year history, Chelsea had won the FA Cup.
So the only disappointing thing was that it had to be at Manchester because when you, know, when you win the cup and that, you've got to walk up the steps and run round. The next day is the thing. You get back to Euston Station and then you start seeing the people and you get on the bus and then you see Chelsea pensioners, all the gear on, all their medals on. And these guys were in tears, you know? And you went, Phew. Everybody was there, there was people throwing streams. It was brilliant. We'd won the FA Cup and that's everybody's dream and that's, uh, that's what the Chelsea supporters wanted. Uh, and they'd eventually got their name on the cup. The following season saw Chelsea finish a respectable sixth in the league and go out of the FA Cup in the fourth round. It didn't matter. Chelsea were off on their second European adventure in five years, beginning with Aris Salonika. The Greek team managed to draw at home, but back at Stamford Bridge, they ran into a spot of bother. Opening up in front of Hinton. Hutchinson playing a little one-two with Hinton. Oh, Marvin Hinton! Slipping badly for Hutchinson. A flick over the goal. With a Baldwin away goal in hand, Chelsea brought CSKA Sofia back to the bridge, where a Dave Webb goal and a virtuoso performance from Peter Bonetti took Chelsea onto the third round, with Bonetti more than living up to his nickname, The Cat. Home legs that saw Bruges beaten 4-0 and Manchester City 1-0 saw Chelsea through to the final against Real Madrid in Athens. It was winning 1-0, and then they scored in the last like, 10 seconds. Unbelievable, they brought the cup out and were ready to present it. But justice was done in the replay, thanks to a superb volley from Dempsey and a winner from Osgood. And Dempsey has scored! Number eight, Baldwin. Osgood. With the Cup Winners' Cup joining the FA Cup in the Stamford Bridge Trophy Cabinet, Chelsea fans settled back and waited, confident there'd be more silverware to come. They waited and waited and waited. The long years without success that followed fueled a myth that the Sexton side simply fell apart. It didn't. The decline was gradual. In 1972, the team, now reinforced by the likes of Chris Garland and Paddy Mulligan, finished a respectable seventh and made it to the final of the League Cup after a cracking semi-final against Spurs. It finished 5-4 on aggregate thanks to a 3-2 win at Stamford Bridge. The final against Stoke was surely a formality. Whether we thought that by turning up was enough, we were still young, we were still young in our minds, but they were a very old side, very uh, experienced, moved the ball around, chased us around, chased around, and they broke us down. Put a naivety by us and scored two goals and lose. One towards Richie, nodded down again, and a good save! That League Cup defeat marked the turning point. On their day, Chelsea could still put four past Leeds, but slowly the results started to disappear as the gap between Sexton and his charismatic superstars widened. Dave was looking for different things. He was playing Alan Hudson right wing, playing me in midfield, and, and he just completely lost faith in us, really. And, and that, once you lose that, and, and, and the players lose respect as well, which we did in the end of the day, we lost respect and just thought, well, it's a waste of time. In 1973, Chelsea finished 12th. The following year, it was 17th, and Peter Osgood, for so long the king of the Fulham Road, was playing for Southampton. It was the end of an era. I couldn't believe how this guy had got to whatever his age, I think it was something like 18, he'd been working on the building site, and he was magnificent from day one. Scored by Osgood. You honestly could think about it for days and days. You could not possibly get a better forward than Peter Osgood. It always reminds me of Van Basten or Albert that used to play for Hungary. That tall, long range of guy, good in the air, physically strong, not frightened. Great skill, good passer, go by people. People maybe laugh, I don't know. I, I watch the television today and I watch a lot of games today. And I see them talking about Ronaldo and people like that. I'd have always good before I had Ronaldo. We can, we can. 50, 60 games a year in all sorts of weather. No, give me Osgood. Carrying away, Osgood. One nil. News that the end was nigh came typically while Osgood was having a drink in a Chelsea pub. We were down the King's Road and uh, uh, in the Markham Arms, and uh, we got a phone call from Eddie McCready saying that David had been sacked. And uh, you know, uh, we, we went, yes, that's great. It's the best thing that happened for us, really, to be honest. Anyway, went back then. He's been reinstated. Um, but. I was sad to leave, I never wanted to leave. Never change a winning side, they say, and at Chelsea they didn't. They sold them, hero by hero. Osgood to Southampton, Hudson to Stoke, Webb to QPR. 20 years on, it's a process that's still painful to recall. True, there were new names to cheer, Droy, Locke, Swain and Britain, and a massive new stand to watch from. So it wasn't all bad news, was it? They built the stand, which, you know, seemed to cause 
you know, coincide with the, some of the players leaving. And I remember the chairman was Brian Mears then calling all the players together to say not to worry that they would make the wages available, although it was a few days later than what it normally is. But you know, it just seemed to coincide with the couple of years from from being a, a top class side to a team of also rams. Given the speed at which Stamford Bridge has changed in the last few seasons, it's difficult to believe the problems that the new East Stand, ironically built to accommodate the crowds that the 1970 Cup team would go on to attract, would cause off the pitch and on. The stadiums that are being built now are built in six months, eight months. The stadium we were building took four years, I think, and all it, you looked up at was a concrete mass and you couldn't see any shape. Not for the first time in Chelsea's history, Stamford Bridge became a ground that away teams looked forward to coming to. Teams used to love to come and play Chelsea because there was no atmosphere. But as a galaxy of stars left the bridge, at least one who would rank alongside them arrived. Ray Wilkins, then better known as Butch, made his league debut when Sexton was still in charge. A year later, with the club firmly on target for second division football, Eddie McCready appointed him captain at the age of 18 against Spurs. I obviously thought one of the other lads would, would pick that up. But Eddie, being Eddie, wanted to start something afresh. And he decided to give it to me, which I was very proud to take, take on the mantle of captain of, of Chelsea. But looking back, possibly was a, a touch too early. To be honest, the team revolved around Ray. He was our bit of class. And uh, he won a lot of games for us that year. He was the main Wilkins. focal point of the team because he made it tick. Um, not many people could get near him at that age that he was to top, top class. Wilkins to take it. At the time, things actually seemed That's a great right. deal less black than they look now. With the popular McCready at the helm, Chelsea would be back in the first division soon enough. I think one of the key elements was we had so many homegrown players playing in that team that we'd grown up together and we were just prepared to work until we dropped for each other. And coupled with some smashing players, some smashing ability, um, we were always going to get promotion. Promotion was confirmed in a memorable home game against Hull. We never actually got the game going for more than 20 minutes, and every time we scored a goal, we got a pitch invasion, which was a bit of a shame, really. I think Eddie had to come on the pitch and appeal to the supporters to stay off it. But it didn't mar the fact that we'd gained promotion and, and in fine fashion as well. And we'd finally done something together as a group of basically homegrown players. And when it finally comes to an end and you realise you've been successful, I think that was a very pleasant time. Four for Chelsea, and what better way from then to say farewell to the second division and go up into the first. But what followed the celebrations was astonishing, even by Chelsea standards. We'd actually finished the season, gone on our summer break, and next thing we knew, we'd lost our manager, which seemed a nonsense, really. We didn't really know the ins and outs of the thing, just that Eddie had left, and then we began to find out about the financial side. He was asking perhaps for a little bit more. Yeah, we were staggered. I think everybody at the club was. Uh, Eddie had done a wonderful job in a nice manner as well. Eddie was a, a jovial character. And... Ken Shellito, the man Doherty once considered as the best right back in England, took over. But with the club in dire financial straits, there was nothing he could do, apart from beat Liverpool 4-2 in the third round of the FA Cup. Two seasons and Danny Blanchflower later, Chelsea were relegated for the second time in four years. And Ray Wilkins was on his way to Manchester United for a record club fee of £825,000. His former teammates would be playing second division football for the next five years. But there was worse to come. As John Neal set about repairing the damage done by an initially promising but eventually disastrous season and a half under Jeff Hurst, Brian Mears, whose family founded the club 77 years earlier, unexpectedly sold Chelsea Football Club and Stamford Bridge to different people. This was to prove not so much a dark hour as a dark ten years and threaten the very existence of the club. People who come to Chelsea these days have no idea what it's like that the people who actually owned what we think of as Chelsea, you know, the stadium, all the land around, these people were not, they wanted to destroy the club. To understand the threat posed to Chelsea needs a bit of a history lesson. In 1982, Chelsea was a football club potentially without a ground. 
In 1905, Joe and Gus Mears had a ground but no football club. They changed Stamford Bridge from an athletics ground to a purpose-built football stadium for exactly the same reason that would lure the property developers to it almost 80 years later. It was central, enjoyed good transport links and would attract the crowds. The one thing old Joe Mears did when he, or H.A. Mears, when he founded the club was he built it in the right place. He built it in this village because in those days, when he started Chelsea, it was a market garden and a sandpit. Stamford Bridge is in Fulham, a borough which already has a famous club bearing its name. So when the cottagers turned down an invitation to move to Stamford Bridge, the Mears brothers decided to start a club from scratch. They found a manager, John Tate Robertson. All they needed was a name. The perfect answer was eventually found the other side of the railway line. Chelsea, a little white line, a stroke of marketing genius. From the start, the crowds loved it. Chelsea's first home game against Hull City may only have been watched by a crowd of 6,000, but by April, 67,000 packed into the bridge to see Chelsea take on Manchester United. But there were problems, albeit of the sort that most owners could only dream of. What nobody could ever know at Stamford Bridge was how many of the crowd were supporting Chelsea, a problem that was still affecting the club 50 years later. Of the famous 100,000 reported to have watched Chelsea against Moscow Dynamo in 1945, how many had come to see the Blues and how many had come to see the novelty of a Soviet side playing in Britain? You never quite knew at Stamford Bridge. Whatever it was that kept the crowds coming to Stamford Bridge, it certainly wasn't results. In the first 54 years of its existence, Chelsea won absolutely nothing of any significance. David Calderhead, for example, the club's second manager, and by far its longest serving, won through to just four FA Cup semi-finals in 26 years. He won just one, but unfortunately there was a war on, so the khaki final of 1915 was not destined to become the club's finest hour, especially not once Sheffield United have won it. Calderhead's last semi-final was in 1932 when Chelsea took on Newcastle. Despite a Huey Gallagher goal, it was still not our year. It was time for somebody else to have a go, but Calderhead's successor, Leslie Knighton, fared no better, although the club gained a reputation for playing even prettier football and getting even larger crowds. In 1939, a crowd of almost 60,000 saw Chelsea beat Arsenal at Stamford Bridge in the third round of the FA Cup, beginning a cup run that would see off Fulham and Sheffield Wednesday before a quarter-final defeat against Grimsby Town. Three days later in the league, Chelsea beat them 5-1. Billy Birrell was next up. You could be injured with Billy Birrell for six months, but as soon as you got back on the field, you was back in the first team. He had his favourites. Birrell had to wait for the end of World War II to get properly underway, although an improvised side did make it to Wembley for the first time in the club's history, when they lost the final of the Football League South Cup to Charlton. A year later, an even more improvised side went one better, beating Millwall in the final of the same competition. It was silverware, but not necessarily as we know it, although a crowd of 90,000 didn't seem to mind. As the war drew to an end, the club embarked on a period of heavy investment, made, as ever, in the certain knowledge that success was, as ever, just around the corner. Two goalkeepers arrived, Bill Robertson and Harry Medhurst, defenders John Harris and Stan Willemsey, inside forward Tommy Walker, and most famously of all, Tommy Lawton, then rated the best centre forward in England. It didn't make any difference, of course. Chelsea's league form was almost worryingly indifferent at times and cut runs were few and far between but as the 40s headed towards their close and Lawton departed for Notts County one man arrived who would make a difference actually it was two men but winger Bobby Campbell would have to wait 40 years for his moment of Chelsea glory Roy Bentley would have to wait seven but it was definitely worth waiting for. In the history of the club, few players can have arrived at Stamford Bridge for a more curious reason than Bentley. He was allergic to Newcastle. I was losing a lot of weight and I never realised why I was losing weight. Evidently, um, and it's been proven since, that the northeast, which is very, very bracing, uh, didn't agree with me. The doctor was aware of it. In fact, he eventually told the club that the best thing that happened with this boy would be to be let go down south again. Burrell might have become a Chelsea legend too, but Arsenal kept getting in his way. In two marathon semi-final battles, the Gunners won both in 1950 and again in 1952. Defeat in the first was particularly cruel. Well, after I was 2-1, Freddie Cox scored straight from a corner. 
he knew the wins at uh, Tottenham. And he used them to score a goal. I mean, that was said by me, if you can believe it. And the other one was a corner again. It was a corner taken by Dennis Compton. I'm going back to Mark Bisley's. As the ball came over, I went up and I couldn't quite get it. It just clipped the top of my head. Can it hit less? Damn me if it didn't hit my shoulder going back. And it went and lobbed up in the air like that and, and dropped in the far post. That was 2 2. Freddie Cox would also score the winner in the replay and would be on the score sheet again as the two clubs drew another semi final in 1952. What happened in the replay is best forgotten about unlike the fifth round tie against Leeds when Chelsea scored five times. But these near misses in the cup were not enough to disguise Chelsea's miserable league form in the 1950s. Birrell announced his retirement at the end of the 1952 season. No championships, no silverware, but he had put in place a youth team structure that his successors would benefit from enormously. The stage was set for Chelsea's fifth manager, Ted Drake. If victory in the 1997 FA Cup laid the ghosts of the 1970 team, it certainly stirred up others, none more so than the team put together by Drake, the only team in the club's history to win the top division championship. Like those who seek to emulate his achievement more than 40 years later, Drake began with one great advantage. He was a great player. He had the charisma of having been a great player himself. You know, that's a great start. And uh, you couldn't argue with, uh, with that. Uh, People his, respected him. Yeah, and his ability to, to score goals and uh, his ability to get stuck in so that he could demand that you got stuck in when it was necessary. Drake also knew what he wanted. And he changed all side round, didn't he? I, I don't, you, you can look it up. I don't know how many players bought in the first couple of years. Ted said in the very first days, three years, you need three years to get the side you want to win you the championship. And damn, we done this. In the end, Drake delivered both good football and good crowds with the help of a team that now included John McNichol, Les Stubbs, Eric Parsons, Frank Bluntstone, Stan Wicks, Peter Sillett, and led, of course, by Bentley. He got his defence right, you know, that could play to our strength, and our strength was in the air to me. It had to, it had to be a long one. Oh, his great strength, of course, was his speed. And uh, his heading ability was tremendous. Uh, you could always run in on uh, crosses, uh, knowing that uh, high balls, that he would be first there. He never encouraged his half-back line, which would be midfield today, use long balls. They had to play the, they were the passing, they wanted to give it to us. Give it to the fast and good wingers, which was Parsons and Frankie, Frankie Blundstone. And I was the one that was looking for all the time to either my chance head for goal or head down to likes of Huey Bennington or whoever, Johnny McNichol. Johnny McNichol scores the equaliser. Peter Sillett was capped for England. Uh, Kenny Armstrong had been capped for England. Roy Bentley had capped for England. Frankie Blunston, capped for England. Stan was uh, picked for uh, the English party. Amazingly, Chelsea's championship season included a run of six games without a win, including an unlikely 6-5 defeat by Manchester United at the bridge. But by Christmas, things were back on track. We played up at West Brom, and I think from that match that we won away, we went on right to the end of the season without hardly losing a match. Going after two months, January, February, coming into March, there weren't many players in the side that didn't think that, my God, we're going to, we're going to win this. So the Wolves thing, it may have had a little tumble when saying about the penalty with Billy right flicking over the bar, but when Peter hit that in, we said, that's it, you know, we've done it. A crowd of over 75,000 had watched Chelsea beat Wolves, their nearest rivals, but confirmation that the championship was really theirs had to wait for the last game of the season against Sheffield Wednesday at Stamford Bridge. Remember those jokes about the pensioners? No more of those now. Watch those boys go. The first one comes from Parsons' head. And doesn't that head get a ruffling by his jubilant teammates? A penalty goal by Sillett. A third goal by Parsons soon after, and it's all over. Even then, they had to wait 15 minutes for all the scores to come in. The crowd waited after the uh, game finished so that we were all brought out again to the stand um, uh, to meet the crowd. All the players were around and that, and seeing all these faces that for years have been waiting and had stayed and stayed with us when things were really bad. At the time, it was, oh, I felt, oh, good, this would be for the people. Happiest moment of my life. I was asked, would we win the cup? 
And I thought we might. But I thought we had a great chance of winning the championship even better. Ted done such a great job off the field that you can't take any credit whatsoever away from him. You know, we say about the team, but you have, you've got to have the right man there to be able to put the pieces together. And, and this is what Ted done. He put a, a whole list uh, of people up that were uh, available for sale. So he, he probably just wanted a new start, uh, but it didn't come off for him. Ted put me on the transfer list. He felt that it was time for the old ones to go. A year after winning the championship, six out of the championship side had to go. At a good age. Drake left two legacies. One was a championship that only Doherty and Sexton have subsequently had a realistic chance of landing until Rude Hullett came along. The other was that from that 1955 season onwards, Chelsea was Stamford Bridge. The fans still wanted to admire good football, but they wanted the best football to be played by the men in blue shirts, which was a bit of a pity in the early 1980s because the club was still in the second division, and it seemed only a matter of time before Marler Estates, the property development company that now owned the ground, got its hands on it. The constant threat of the ground being bulldozed and this mythical site off the M25 being made available. We know it never would have been, and that if Chelsea left the bridge, it was going to be the end of the club. And uh, I can remember giving evidence for the club uh, with the planning appeal at uh, Fulham Town Hall. I can remember endlessly being closeted with Ken as we discussed tactics. I can remember him telling me once he'd spent more than two million, I mean, and we're talking real money back in the 80s, two million when the club didn't have a lot of money, He'd spent two million on legal fees to fight the developers off. One man, however, was having none of it. In 1982, Ken Bates, a businessman who quickly gained a reputation for straight talking, bought the club, took on its massive debts and prepared to do battle. But not even he could have known just how long it would take him to secure Chelsea's future. In 1982, I was asked if I'd take it and I jumped to the chance. I regarded it as a challenge that was worthwhile interest. I sold my other business interest and made it my life's work and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Some of my knockers have said, well, you know, if I hadn't come along, somebody else would have done, and if this, this, and that, but the fact is, they didn't. Never a man to court popularity. It's only now, as his dream for a new Stamford Bridge becomes reality, that the nature of what he achieved is becoming understood. Chelsea comes from, from behind, if you like, if you think about it. And Arsenal and Tottenham were building their stands, and they had a competition, because we competed in London. I mean, Chelsea was hanging on by the skin of its teeth to um, to stay alive and the only thing I th quickly realised that the only way that we would ever catch up with these people and take them on was we had to develop our off-field activities. I don't think most supporters know how near the club came to destruction. You know, what's only really in the eye of history, just a sort of, you know, a spitting distance away. Bates is stuck by the club, Bates has done everything for this club and Bates is Chelsea, basically. Uh, I, I don't think you could ever forget him uh, because he's, he's done so much, he's turned it around. Uh, there was hard times, he had the hard times, and now there's good times. It is a good partnership because he knows exactly where he has to be for the team and he knows exactly also to step out of the team. And I think that makes a, a good chairman because if you want to be uh, all the time everywhere, screaming, shouting, everything, then things going... Uh, going away he gives people responsibility and that works and everybody knows what to do but back in 1983 with more grass growing through the crumbling shed terraces than there was on the pitch the idea of Stamford Bridge as an all-seater stadium with its own hotel restaurants bars and Chelsea Village having its own stock market listing seemed the stuff of fantasy as for what was going on on the pitch, that was more a nightmare. If 1955 was the club's finest hour, then May 1983 was its darkest, when Chelsea had to beat Bolton to avoid relegation to the third division for the first time in its history. Remarkable to think that just 12 months previously, they dumped the mighty Liverpool out of the FA Cup. Back in 1983, John Neal's third season in charge saw the arrival of a centre-forward
who came to personify Chelsea in the 80s. Here's Kerry Dixon with a great chance. There was uh, four clubs, I think, in for me at the time. For me, Chelsea were the biggest of the, of the four, even though they were in the second division. Ken Bates took me down to Aberystwyth, where the uh, lads were training at the time, and he explained his, uh, his dream to me of uh, how he saw Chelsea and uh, what he would like, and he said that um, there's five or six new players coming in that season. Among those joining a team that already included such stalwarts as Clive Walker, Colin Pates, John Bumstead and Nigel Spackman were David Speedy, Pat Nevin and goalkeeper Eddie Nijveski. We uh, integrated very, very well and uh, to be honest we won our first game 5-0 at home to Derby and it sort of all took off from there. Everybody became very, very excited. Neil had bought well and his team were promoted as champions. The championship goal would come away at Grimsby, but victories over the chairman's old club, Oldham, and Manchester City, another big club now enduring leaner times, helped put John Neil's hugely popular team back where they belonged. Obviously, myself, uh, David Speedy and Pat Nevin grabbed a lot of the limelight, which was a little bit unfair of some of the unsung heroes. I mean, Eddie Nzwicky, for example, was a fantastic goalkeeper. And for me, he would have been in the top five I've ever seen. The following season should be remembered for a hugely impressive finish of sixth place in the league. And Dixon again! And Chelsea have But as ever with Chelsea, it's the cup games that stay in the memory. None more so than a certain milk cup encounter with Sheffield Wednesday. At the bridge, a David Speedy goal had ensured a 1-1 draw. But back at Hillsborough two days later, Chelsea trailed by three goals to nil. I mean, I was a little bit too easy to beat that night, but no, I mean, to be fair, they played terrifically well in the first half. We didn't get close enough to them, and they scored some good goals. A couple of months later, we heard that uh, in the Sheffield Wednesday dressing room at half-time, I mean, they were winning 3 nil, and they were sort of joking along, oh, let me score, let me score. I think John Hollins was very instrumental being a coach at the time as well, and Ian McNeil, and they basically said, look, you now go out and play for your pride. You're, you're representing Chelsea Football Club, and Panaville was... Uh, came on as a substitute in the second half and with virtually his first touch he scored. Canneville playing out wide on the left and involved early. Oh, what a start! And they had a little bit of a wobble, a little bit of a panic up and, and uh, we just kept flying forward, you know, we kept opening them up for fun and uh, and then we went, we actually went 4-3 ahead. By Mickey Thomas. The ball for Dixon to chase and he'll get there. Oh, he's found Canneville! Chelsea have done it! And then poor old Dougie stuck a foot out and tripped Mel Sterling and uh, the saga went on back to Stamford Bridge we won the toss and uh, Mickey Thomas grabbed the winner down at uh, Stamford Bridge still Nevin is it in it is here's Thomas it's there it was a wonderful win but typically Chelsea were bundled out of the semi-final by a Sunderland team that now included Clive Walker the following season began with a shock managerial reshuffle Ill health forced popular and successful Neil to move upstairs to assist the chairman, and the loyal John Hollins took over as manager. The fans willed it to work, but after an impressive first season which saw the club repeat its sixth place and win the full Members' Cup at Wembley, it started to go wrong. The next season, Chelsea finished 14th, and the next, well, that was a familiar story. You know, the players had the great regard for him as a coach. Um, I think he found it very difficult when he became manager. I think uh, and he had decisions to make and he, he wasn't frightened to make those decisions. But unfortunately, you know, uh, you judge by your decisions. And at the time, they, they didn't quite go as well for John as possibly they could have done. It was hard for me just coming into a new club and settling in with new players. And everybody was on a downer. And uh, the only way we was going to go was down because it, no one was pulling together. And we needed to be, you know, together. And, Sadly, that wasn't the case. The arrival of Bobby Campbell, Chelsea's winger from the 1950s, and now an experienced manager, could do nothing in a battle where it often seemed easier for Chelsea to stay up than go down. The playoffs simply prolonged the agony, especially with Chelsea putting six past promotion hopefuls Blackburn Rovers. But defeat against Middlesbrough meant Chelsea were relegated once again, despite finishing fourth from bottom. Chelsea, however, bounced straight back as runaway champions of the second division. I think the manager at the time, Bobby Campbell, made some good signings. He, he brought in Peter Nicholas and Graham Roberts, who had a lot of experience. And that helped us to stabilise the club a little bit and make sure that we, we were progressive and got ourselves straight back at the first attempt. It wasn't as an enjoyable season as the one um, when I first came because the expectancy levels started to rise. And by about Christmas time, everyone was saying, well, Chelsea will win the title. 
sure enough, by about Easter time, we'd virtually had it wrapped up with a 26-game unbeaten run. And it's an amazing break by Chelsea. And Tony DiRigo, who goes round Dibble and finishes it all in style and surely quell the Manchester City fire. Campbell consolidated promotion with a hugely impressive fifth place and another victory in the full members' cup. His second season, however, saw Chelsea slip to 11th. As for cups, Oxford knocked us out of the FA Cup. Only the League Cup, then lumbering under the Rumbelow banner, offered much hope, especially after a win over Spurs in the fifth round. But sadly, especially for Campbell, there was to be no repeat of 1985 when Chelsea faced Sheffield Wednesday in the fifth round. Ian Porterfield's season and a half in the limelight had arrived. His first move was not a popular one. To Dixon, to the back of the net. Dixon is there first. And Dixon with the touch. And that's another. Dixon gets his hat-trick. And he reaches the cross and scores! And Kerry Dixon! I was basically told that uh, I wasn't going to be in the plans for the forthcoming season. I decided that Kerry Dixon, at the age of 31, didn't really need reserve team football. Uh, one of the sad aspects was I was nine goals short of the record, Bobby Tamlin's. But with Steve Clark, Graham Lasso, and Dennis Wise already in the side and the signing of Paul Elliott, it wasn't all bad news, especially when Chelsea made it to the quarter-final of the 1992 FA Cup. Typical of Chelsea, insofar as we can go out and play well against people that mattered, but there'd always been some unfashionable, unassuming type of opposition that would turn around and get the better of us. It was an equaliser by one of those sides that took Chelsea back to Roker Park and out of the FA Cup. There were a lot of, a lot of potentially very high moments at Chelsea in those days and, and unfortunately they all ended in, in sort of disappointment. But that's something that, that was a sign of the times then. One of those high moments that didn't end in disappointment came when Chelsea finally beat Liverpool at Anfield for the first time in 56 years. But I've always said the most important player at the club is Dennis Wise. He was then when I was there and he's in his eighth season now, and he is the most important component in the side. He brings something to Chelsea that you said to yourself, if he wasn't there, the club wouldn't be the same. He wouldn't have the same, I mean, the team wouldn't have the same stability, the same reassurance, the same will to win. But despite such one-off successes, league positions of 14th and 11th, the latter eventually secured by his short-lived replacement, Dave Webb, was never going to be good enough to keep Porterfield in a job. With the arrival of Glenn Hoddle, our story is about to turn full circle, and all because things off the pitch were finally going the club's way. Ken Bates' ten-year battle to keep Chelsea at Stamford Bridge may have cost millions of pounds in legal fees, but it had seen off two property development companies and a house builder. With the property market in the grip of recession, the freehold of Stamford Bridge ended up in the hands of the bank. Both sides were confident they could do business. Then just when it was all getting straightforward, Matthew Harding, a fanatical Chelsea fan with seemingly limitless amounts of cash, arrived on the scene and it all got complicated again. You know, he was the new boy on the block and he was a media man. It was ideal from the, and he enjoyed being in the limelight. So that's when all the stories kept drifting out that I didn't agree with this and he didn't agree with that. He never said anything like that to my face. And I think if I may say so, one of the reasons why Ken found it so difficult to adjust to Matthew Harding is that Ken could never understand if Matthew cared as much as he did about Chelsea, why during all that time in the 80s, and Matthew had, you know, he didn't have as much money as he ultimately had, but he had quite a lot of money in those days, didn't come down and offer to lend a hand when the club was nearly going under. And of course, he could never understand why Matthew suddenly emerged and seemed to want Ken to sort of shuffle off the stage and Matthew to take over, just when Ken, after more than a decade of really hard work, had got the club right, you see. Unlike Bates, Harding courted publicity and was not afraid to put his money where his mouth was, largely in the shape of short-term loans to build the splendid stand that now bears his name and for the buying of players. His only long-term investment was the freehold to the ground itself, although the club retain an option to buy it back at a pre-agreed price. That is still the intention of Chelsea pitch owners. Harding's largesse and outgoing nature made him a firm favourite with the fans, but not always with Ken Bates. 
The tragic death of Matthew Harding has touched not only the footballing nation, but the whole nation. Harding and four others perished when their helicopter came down in Cheshire. But at the time of his tragically early death, the differences between them had been settled. Ironically, at a meeting at which Bates had planned to repay all the outstanding loans and sever all links between Harding and the club. We gave him his player loan money back, which was in fact only £2.7 million. And I suggested, in fact, uh, that it would be better if we parted. And within seven days, we'd done a deal. That's when he put another £5 million, £10 million pounds in the club. So a total of 15. That's what he bet when they got 15 million pounds. And we never looked back. I mean, we then became good friends again. But if Harding's aim was to see a top-class side playing at a top-class ground, he couldn't be disappointed with the way Rudy's revolution was going. In the middle, Viali scampers through a good position. Hughes off the post, put it in. The game that we had to play against Tottenham, I think then from that game on, we start to play, I think. then. There was a different uh, atmosphere. There was something like a lift or something, a spiritual lift or something. It was a revolution that began with the signing of Gianluca Viali, a player who came to symbolise the new cosmopolitan era that was dawning at Chelsea. I knew that there were a very good cl uh, club in the early 70s, and uh, I knew that the uh, last 25 years they didn't win anything. Then came Roberto Di Matteo, a player who would make history with a club record transfer fee of £4.9 million and would repay it all with one strike of the ball. Thankfully for the club accountants, he managed a few more along the way. Frank Leboeuf soon joined them. A Frenchman whose tackling and powerful passing made him the most creative defender Chelsea had had since Hullet gave up playing sweeper. But an already absorbing season was transformed by the signing of Gianfranco Zola, introducing a player very much in the mould of Chelsea favourites, such as Nevin, Cook and Blunstone. Only he was probably better than all of them on a good day, which happily, for his army of fans, was most days. I think it was uh, a boost to the uh, fans who obviously felt like we all did, the uh, tragic loss of, uh, uh, of Matthew. Came out of the blue, that he was available and because we expressed an interest uh, previously we got the first bite at the cherry and I remember taking the call and uh, ringing Rude and saying there is an opportunity to um, to get uh, Zola and within uh, three days we had uh, wrapped it up and um, obviously from there he has uh, proved uh, a tremendous uh, influence and a, a great impact not only on Chelsea but the, uh, the English game. With so many new players arriving, it was too early to be considered as serious championship contenders, but the FA Cup looked a real possibility, at least until we drew Liverpool in the fourth round. The match didn't start very well because we were uh, too, too down after 25, 30 minutes. We, we were not playing so bad, but uh, they have uh, two or three occasions they scored two goals. To be the kill everyone, but not uh, not us. We didn't feel as though we were so far out of the game that we weren't going to get back in it. We had a chat at half time. The manager said, "Look, if you get the next goal, get it back to two one. Anything can happen." He said, "Let's start playing football," and now he changed uh, a little bit the tactic in the half time. I knew that they, they could win the game. I was all very calm also because I knew that we made some mistakes. I knew also where their weakness was with Di Matteo putting John Barnes under pressure. The stage was set for the arrival of Mark Hughes. I actually thought the lad was going to get a tackle in, but he didn't, so I just swung a boot on it. Didn't hit it particularly well, but very pleased to see it go in the bottom corner. Oh, yes! That's what they were missing! The way we attacked, the, the manner in which we attacked them, we were really we were quite ruthless we got at them, and we caused a very good side like Liverpool to, to look very ordinary. It was very, very good goal, and uh, sometimes I try to, to do the same thing in, in, in training, but I, I'm not able to do it anymore. <laughs> so a very, very, very special goal. That was as good a spell as I, I've been involved in, I think, for, for drama and actual excitement and buzz of being involved in something like that was, was unbelievable. Viali! Viali for Chelsea! It's 3 two. Can you believe this? We could have scored uh, more than four, and I scored the last two. Of course, my, my feeling was the end of the match. I was 
the happiest man in the world. supporters hailing one of the great recoveries in the FA Cup. Having beaten one of the best teams in the land, Chelsea typically found it harder work getting past more ordinary opposition. Absolute cracking drive from Di Matteo. Oh. Hughes, they've got a man over on the far side, they don't need him, it's 2-0, Hughes the score. 2-0 up, cruising, uh, first half, uh, I think we took the our foot off the pedal and let them back into the game, 2-1. <clears throat> And then they got a free kick, I don't know, last five minutes, whipped a ball in. Uh, There's a bit of confusion between me and Hitch. I'll just stop my leg out and the ball's in the back of the neck. Uh, I'm go. <laughs> but uh, bring them back to Stamford Bridge. Still, again, we was confident we was going to beat them. And we was all over them, but they was holding out really well. Uh, we'd done everything but scoring that game until the end when uh, Ellen went, went through and got that uh, dubious uh, decision. I, was, I wasn't really very calm inside <laughs> because I said before to all the press I wanted to win the FA Cup and I have the chance to put Chelsea in the quarter-final. It was, it was very important to, to score and I say, OK, forget everything. Think just about the penalty and that's why I look like cool, but I wasn't, I wasn't really. Tough game, but we won it and that showed us that uh, we can beat tough teams as well. At Fratton Park, the quarter-final went rather more according to plan. And Clark, can he follow it in? And space in the centre, found by Hughes on the four. Number three for Chelsea from Gianfranco Zola. But Wise is in, thank you very much. Chelsea back in full ascendancy. A league defeat at Stamford Bridge suggested a semi-final against Wimbledon at Highbury was not something to be looked forward to, but this time there was a master plan. I knew a little bit what they wanted from us, where, and we also knew where their weaknesses were. And uh, we anticipated them. It was probably the first time we, we actually picked a side to do a specific job. We actually played with four centre-halves along the back four, every one of them, Stevie Clark, Frank LeBerth, Erlen Johnson, Frank Sinclair, they're all centre-halves really. We just said, you defend, the midfield three defend, and the front three do the damage, Di Matteo, Zola and Hughes. And uh, that's how it worked out, I think. He's got Wise going outside him now. Hughes in the middle with Burley. And it, Hughes, yes, Chelsea have scored! Di Matteo is square of him. Zola's made a run right to left now, nipping in there. Oh, he's turned well, Zola! It's Zola! It's there! It's Chelsea's second! He's on the side, Mark Hughes, it came off Chris Berry. Can he make it three? Yes, he can! Hughes again, and Hullet's team are there now. We went into the game so confident uh, there was only going to be one winner. You know, we was determined in the way we was going to defend, and the ability would come out anyway. Chelsea were back at their second FA Cup final in four seasons. This time, the team was determined that the outcome would be different. Last time, we had quite a few young players, a lot of players who hadn't experienced the atmosphere at Wembley before, and. Uh, we was taken back by the atmosphere, really. It was like the day first, the game second. This time it was the game first, the day second. Let the fans enjoy the day. But we're the professionals, we've got to go out there and get the silverware. To be honest with you, I was more nervous before the cup final that just went than the, the one before, because playing against a team who's good, supposedly going to beat you. Um, but this time round, it was like every, the expectancy was there. Now the first sign of Chelsea on the attack with Di Matteo. Well, it was, I was. I was actually just starting to get the try to organise the defence and settle down into the game. Uh, it was just basically I, I nicked the ball off a Mustard, I think it was, and uh, played Robbie in the halfway line, and he just kept going. <laughs> I just ran off from our half, and I thought, yeah. Right, I was screaming down the right hand side, calling for Robbie to pass it out wide for me. You know, I hadn't had a touch of the ball yet. Oh, and a good run up front by him. I was ducking and weaving in front of him. I wasn't too far behind him, to be fair. Yeah, we're standing right behind him. I was just be behind uh, Roberto. I, I had a, a very good view. I was just behind the ball. It just shows you we must have been playing on a straight line. <laughs> as soon as it hit the crossbar, it just seemed like the whole place went quiet, and then they realised that it had uh, gone in. 
I went crazy after the goal and I don't remember what happened after. It's possibly the quickest ever goal in a Wembley Cup final. I tried to chase him and <laughs> I'd still be chasing him now if I didn't stop, I don't think. It's Roberto Di Matteo inside 45 seconds. <laughs> I was running, trying to, to catch Roberto Di Matteo. <laughs> And Chelsea come away again with Newton. We needed a second goal, and it did. It is it's done, and it was really, very important for us. And Chelsea come away again with Newton. Petrescu is to the right. Dan Petrescu got the ball, whipped a great ball over, a great flip from Zola, and I just put it in the back of the net with my left foot. And it's there. It's Eddie Newton for Chelsea. It's two 0 Looks like Chelsea's cut now, and it's a moment for Chelsea to cherish. It was a blue day all right, and the Chelsea faithful were in the mood to party. So, not surprisingly, were the players. The best thing is uh, picking it up. I wanted to go to pick it up, make everyone cheer, and then don't put it up, and then pick, put it up, but <laughs> just to wind them up. But I thought, no, I'll do it properly. I said to Steve Clark to make sure that he was up the front of the queue, so that when they lifted the trophy up, uh, He'd be on all the pictures, but uh, unfortunately for Steve, as, as why he lifted the cup up, he was getting his medal, so we, he had uh, his back to everybody. I played only three minutes, but I could say uh, to my nephew that uh, I won an FA Cup. We'd done the usual, we'd gone round the pitch, right round the whole pitch and we got to the tunnel and I think it was Graham Rick said to us, said, look, this is the bit you should remember, so go back out, milk it hunt. That's when we did the famous Charles down the pitch. I will, I will just remind the whole day as, a, as something special in my life. As the fans celebrated the return of the FA Cup to Stamford Bridge for the first time in 27 years, the players celebrated, and so at long last did the fans. Others, however, were already looking to the future. And it's a very exciting time, and uh, I, like everybody else, want to take uh, that forward so that uh, Chelsea really does achieve as we come up to the uh, millennium. Like constructing a castle, you know, little, little, you know, try to build it up. There's always somebody who tries to flick it off again, you know. And then you build it up again. And then so on, you build it slowly, slowly, slowly. Don't go too fast. I don't want to go too fast. Just step by step. I'd like to see this place finished. And I'd like to see the European Champion Cup being handed to us on that pitch. Just this side of the backyard instead.